These are one of my favorite fruits that we have growing wild in the UK. These are wild raspberry, Rubus edaeus. They're not as common in the UK as they used to be, but you can still find them in waste grounds and in hedgerows, and especially in open woodlands. If you find a pathway or an opening in a deciduous woodland in July, that's the best place to look for wild raspberries. And when you do eventually find them, you can find really big patches of them. And they don't usually all fruit and ripen at the same time. So you can come throughout July and early August. You see wild raspberries are a bit smaller than the cultivated types, but they're just as tasty. Apologies for my voice, by the way. I've just, I'm just recovering from COVID, so sounding a bit croaky. Unlike other rubus species like brambles, raspberries grow on upright canes. Also the thorns or prickles on raspberry are tiny compared to the thorns on a bramble bush, which are really sharp. You can almost miss the ones on the raspberry because they're so small. A good way to tell raspberry from bramble before you see the fruits appear is the leaves. Bramble leaves will be green on both sides, but raspberries are green on top and they're white underneath and they're quite soft. Raspberry flowers have five white to pinkish petals, which can look fairly similar to bramble flowers. But if you look behind the petals, you'll see five sepals, the triangular bracts here. And at the edge of those bracts, you've got quite a distinctive white margin. And that's a good way to separate the flowers from bramble. A good thing about wild raspberries is that a lot of people just walk straight past them thinking that they're unripe blackberries. But a good way to tell, first of all, simply the ripe raspberry will be quite soft. Whereas an unripe pink blackberry will be solid. And second, when you pick a ripe raspberry, it will leave its core behind on the stem, leaving a hollow fruit. And blackberries do not do that. They keep the core in the fruit when you pick them. Raspberries have lots of uses. They're especially good made into jam or a vinegar infusion. But my favorite use for them is just to eat them straight off the bush or have them sprinkled on top of yogurt and granola for breakfast. Here's a nice patch of wild raspberry. See on both sides of the path. So you can see they're all upright canes. And the really small fawns. A lot of the time these fawns are red. That's a better example of the underside of the leaf there. It's really white. That's a bramble growing in amongst it there. You see much bigger fawns. And the leaves should be green underneath. This awesome looking plant is Great Mullen for Bascom Fapsis. It's a huge plant from the figwort family that can grow well over two meters. 
It looks like some sort of tropical plant, but it is native to the UK. It's a biennial, so it has a two year growth cycle. In its first year, it will form a basal rosette. And then in its second year, it will send up this tall flowering stem. It can grow in most habitats, especially waste grounds and field edges, and sometimes woodland clearings. Places like this open cycle path are perfect for it as it needs full sun. The leaves are really densely covered in hairs and it gives them a bit of a silvery sheen. They're really soft and they almost feel like felt. The lower leaves are huge. They can get up to almost 50 centimeters long. You get them quite a lot bigger than this. Higher up on the plant you go, the smaller the leaves get. The flowers will grow throughout the summer. They don't all open at once. They just kind of seem to grow at random. They just pop up anywhere on this flower stem. A lot of flower heads like this, they'll start from the bottom and then they'll work their way up through the summer, but not with mullein. They'll just open anywhere. The flowers are yellow and have five petals. And these flower spikes are really dense. The main stem is really strong, quite sturdy. You can't even really bend it. And most of the time you just get one tall flower spike like this. Sometimes it branches and you get several flower heads like this. But yeah, most of the time it's just one. The leaves and the flowers of mullein can be used. The plant is used medicinally to help chest complaints and it's an expectorant, so helps remove mucus from the lungs. It also has strong antiseptic and anti-inflammatory properties and it really helps soothe a sore throat. As I said before, I recently had COVID making a tea out of mullein flower and linden flower has really helped my chest. The leaves also make a good tea, though the fine hairs that are on the leaves are an irritant, so you need to strain them off before you drink the tea. If you're harvesting the leaves for the first time, it's best to wait until you see the plant flowering, just because the basal leaves can look a little bit similar to foxglove, which is also in the figwort family. But once great mullein is in flower, it's unmistakable from any other plant. When you're picking the flowers, it's best to take them home and sit them on a tray in your garden for a few hours to let any beetles escape because you do get quite a lot of beetles living in these flowers. And these flowers can also be infused into a sugar syrup to make a cough syrup, which is really, really good if you've got a sore chest. Apparently the central stem, when it's dried, makes a really good hand drill for fire by friction. I've not done that myself yet though. Another good use for this plant, the leaves make really good toilet paper. In fact, another name for this plant is Cowboy's Toilet Paper. So if the shops run out again, you know what to do. And also the larger basil leaves used to be used as nappies before we started using the plastic ones because they're really big, soft and apparently quite absorbent as well. So.
There's another really nice fruit of the summer. These are wild strawberries or alpine strawberries, Fragaria vesca. Quite similar to the strawberries you can buy in the shops, but they're a lot smaller. This is pretty much a full size wild strawberry. They don't really get any bigger than a little fingernail. But what they lack in size, they make up for in flavor. They're really tasty. They've got a really intense, sweet strawberry flavor. To be honest, I've never really made anything with them because they never make it all the way back to the kitchen. I pretty much just snack on them on the go. If you've ever grown strawberries at home in your garden, you'll notice the leaves are very similar. They're divided into three and they're serrated. You can find wild strawberries in woodland clearings, but I find best if you look along country roads like this, if you've got like muddy banks, just look along for the, the strawberry leaves and you'll find the little red fruits just kind of pop out at you. Once you see a couple, you usually end up seeing quite a lot of them. And they fruit consecutively through the summer. So you keep coming back for a good month or two and you should find more. This is fireweed or Rose Bay willow herb. Back in April, I talked about harvesting the young shoots of this plant. Now in summer, there's several more parts of this plant we can harvest. It's quite an easy plant to spot in summer. You get these tall spikes of pink to purple flowers that can grow in quite large patches. The leaves of fireweed spiral around the stem. And the leaves are long and narrow and come to a pointed tip. They have quite a prominent white midrib. If you look closely, you'll see the veins don't reach all the way to the margin of the leaf. They come right to the near to the margin and then they meet up with the other veins in a loop. The flowers have four petals that are pink to purple and they have four darker purple sepals in between. So they flower from the bottom of the flower spike and then work their way progressively upwards throughout the summer. You can see the flowers that are dying back there. These are the fresh blooms and then ones that haven't quite opened yet at the top. The flowers can be eaten as a salad garnish they add a nice splash of colour. The younger leaves from side shoots like this can also be eaten as a salad green. The older leaves are good for making tea. I've not tried it yet, but the Russian tea, Ivan Chai, is apparently really good. It's made from fermenting the older leaves like this. My favorite part of the plant is the pith from inside the central stem. Just cut the stem at the base, then remove the flower head. It's 
strip off the leaves, keep them for making tea. Then cut the stem the entire length and remove the pith with the point of your knife. It tastes just like cucumber. It can be eaten raw as it is, as a snack, or added to soups to help them thicken. Here's something that I harvest every summer and collect enough to last throughout the year. These are nettle seeds and these are highly nutritious and a great energy booster. So if you feel a bit lethargic in the morning sometimes, these could be really good for you. You can sprinkle them in your cereal or on some yogurt or like I do, just put a spoonful in with a green smoothie. Just make sure you're actually collecting the seeds and not the male flowers. A nettle plant can either be male or female. It's not a big problem if you accidentally collect the male pollen bearing flowers. They're not toxic, but they won't have all the health benefits of the female plant seeds. So how do you tell the difference? This is a male plant here and you see the flower clusters are much thinner and stringier and they grow out to the side or slightly pointing upwards whereas the female clusters are much thicker and they droop downwards especially as the seeds develop the individual seeds are triangular another name for the seeds are bishop's hats because of the triangular shape so that's a male on the right and a female on the left. You see there's quite a big difference in the size of the clusters. So it's best to collect nettle seeds when they're at this stage, when they're still nice and bright green although it is fine to collect them when they're turning brown and you get some huge patches of nettles so you can collect a lot of the seeds so there's two methods to collecting nettle seeds the quickest way is just to get the top part of the plant that's got the seeds on just pick the whole stem take that home and dry it and then you can pick the seeds off quite easily because you won't get stung when the plant is dried but if you don't have room to lay out all the plants and dry them then you can just pick the clusters directly off the plant collect them up like that and then take them home and dry them that way I don't really have much room where I'm living at the moment, so this is the way that I'm gonna do it this time. I have got a video going into more detail on processing the nettle seeds. I'll leave a link in the description of this video. You can dry the seeds in a dehydrator, but in nice weather like this, it's much better to sit them on drying racks and leave them either outside or by a windowsill. And once they're dried, just store them in a jar and keep them out of direct sunlight. This is Meadowsweet, Philopendula ulmaria, a member of the rose family that can grow up to about one and a half meters. It's a plant that loves damp places, so look along riverbanks and streams, and also damp woodlands and ditches. This sort of area is perfect for it. We've got footpaths going through woodlands and then you get a bit of a drainage ditch to the side. It's often covered with meadow sweet. This ground here is normally quite wet but we're going through a very dry spell at the moment. The name meadow sweet actually has nothing to do with meadows. 
it's because the flowers were traditionally used to flavour mead. The leaves make this plant quite easy to identify because they're quite distinctive looking. First of all, they grow on a red stem. They have several pairs of opposing leaflets and one terminal leaflet that has either three or five lobes. The leaflets are serrated and they're paler underneath. And also they have tiny leaflets in between the larger ones. The stems of meadowsweet are really slender and they're either green or with a reddish tinge. And the flowers of meadowsweet start growing just as the flowers of elderflower are dying back. They're white and grow in frothy clusters and they have a nice sweet smell with a bit of an almond scent in the background. All parts of meadowsweet are edible but you shouldn't eat too much at once because the plant contains salicylic acid which is what aspirin can be synthesized from. It can be used as an anti-inflammatory and for mild pain relief however if you want to use wild plants for medication you should always do more research into it yourself. The leaves and flowers are good for making tea and as I said before the flowers can be used for flavouring alcoholic drinks like mead and can also be made into a cordial. The flowers of meadowsweet can be used in pretty much the same way as elderflower and the flavour of meadowsweet is really one that splits opinion. Some people like me really like it and you get a nice sweet armoury flavour from it and other people say it just tastes really medicinal.